I don't know about the quality of the sermon tonight. Things ain't getting off to a good start. I got a crinkle in my sock. <laughs> Britches are sticking to my leg. I lost my little doodad in the pew. Didn't know if I was going to be able to find it. I think it's all because I didn't wear my Tennessee tie tonight. Amen. That's what I think. And so, but Dennis, you missed that, buddy. But last night I wore it and it was a humdinger. So, uh, y'all try me again later on in the week. I'll make sure to wear it. Right? I want you to open up your Bibles. I know y'all bought them. I want to see Bibles out in laps and pages turning. Miss Pam, she'll just follow along. Right? And I want you to mark in your Bibles 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1. Turn over. The brethren down in Texas like it when I do this, so I'm going to do it with y'all, and maybe some of y'all like it. 1 Peter chapter 1. You stick a piece of paper, a pencil, something in there. Mark it. And then, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Peter 1. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And stick a marker, a piece of paper, a finger, something in there and mark that. Okay? And then turn to Acts chapter 1. Alright? 1 Peter 1. 1 Corinthians 15. And then Acts chapter 1. Well, then there are a lot of different lessons that can be preached and they have a lot of different designs behind them. The lesson tonight is going to be one to draw attention to an episode in the life of our Lord. And in doing so, I want to heighten your appreciation for this event. I want to underscore its importance for us. Draw some lessons that you and I can extrapolate from the text all in an effort to deepen our faith and to trust in that hope that should reside within each and every one of us. Amen? Amen. All right. There are a lot of episodes within the life of Jesus that are noteworthy. There are, we can start at His birth. Uh, born of a virgin, it was a miracle. Uh, maybe we can talk about His boyhood and how Joseph and Mary... Uh, left the premises because of the danger. Maybe we can think about that episode that Luke records where young Jesus is in the temple. Remember? And uh, where he says, you know, I must be about my father's business. We remember that. Maybe we can turn to the first miracle uh, in the chronology of our Lord's ministry that is found in John chapter 2 and is turning the water into wine. We've already discussed that briefly this week. Maybe we can talk about Him walking on the water. Maybe one of those various... The healing of Jairus' daughter. The widow at Nain. Or maybe we can turn to that Sermon on the Mount or His discourse at Mount Olivier. Okay? Or maybe we could uh, turn to some of the things that he had to say to his apostles. Oh yes, those are some good dialogues found there, aren't there? As they struggled to grasp the spiritual worth and value of what our Lord was trying to relate to them. Uh, or maybe, what about one of those, those episodes with those wicked, conniving Jews? What about that? As our Lord, they continually challenged Him, trying to stick it to Him, and He deflated them. Amen. Time and time again. Uh, my Uncle LeBond's here, and his daddy told my daddy a story one time. And he said, uh, Steve, he said, you know how to bury a Texan. You remember that, Uncle LeBond? He said, you can do it with a matchbox and a toothpick. 
poke a hole in them, blow all the hot air out of them, and you can stick them in the matchbox. There are a lot of things that you and I could point to. And of course, we hadn't even gotten, have we, to consider the events surrounding His death, His burial, or His resurrection. But allow me to make this statement. Of the death, the burial, the resurrection, the parables, the miracles, all of it, concerning our Lord's tenure here upon this earth, oftentimes we skip over His ascension. We skip over it. We read it, And we think to ourselves, maybe, well, it is what it is. It says what it says. And let's go on and turn the page and get into Acts chapter 2 where it gets good. Right? And I want us to stop and to think for a moment upon this episode and draw from its worth. It is not written in the Bible to fill space. There is no space filler in the Bible. It is there for our benefit. And I'd like to start like this, brethren. I'm going to start in a well-known passage. Remember there in Mark chapter 16, where our Lord is giving the Great Commission, and Mark is going to record that. He says, Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and he that does not believe shall be condemned. We remember that. But allow your eyes to drift on down to verse number 19 and you'll see what Mark records. He says this, So then, after the Lord had spoken to them, watch it, He was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. Oh, isn't that good? Again, in the book of Luke, in Luke chapter 24, he echoes the same sentiments. In verse number 51, this is what he says. And when he, that's Jesus, had been parted from them, he was carried up into heaven. And then finally, uh, we could not talk about this subject without mentioning the Apostle Peter. And remember that Peter would say in 1 Peter chapter 3 and in verse number 22 concerning Jesus, he says this, Who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to Him. But perhaps of all the passages that we can draw on that talk about our Lord's ascension, none is more prolific than the passage that I want to read starting off here tonight in Acts chapter 1. And I want you to turn your eyes down here. Remember that our Lord's death is associated with the Passover. Okay? He dies. He dies. And... The Bible says in Acts chapter 1 and verse number 30, uh, in verse number 3, rather, that after he rose up out of his tomb, he stayed 40 days with his disciples. Now you remember that our Lord's death is associated with the Passover. The inauguration of the church in Acts chapter 2 is associated with Pentecost. There's 50 days in between the Passover and the Pentecost. Our Lord spent 40 of those days with His disciples before He ascended up into heaven. And He is with them for the last time. Here in verse number 8, notice there that verse number 8 ought to to be underlined in your Bible. Uh, There He is going to regurgitate or reiterate the Great Commission to them. They were to be witnesses, weren't they? In Jerusalem, in Judea, all through Samaria, and eventually throughout the ends of the world. And you can track that progression as you read the book of Acts. Right? Finally, by the book of Colossians, in Colossians chapter 1 and in verse number 13, the Apostle Paul can say that the gospel was preached to every creature under heaven. Isn't that wonderful? But notice what happens. He reiterates the Great Commission and we pick up in verse number 9. Follow along with me. And when He had spoken these things, while they watched, He was taken up and a cloud received Him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven, as He went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. 
This should be interpreted none other than angelic beings. Angelic beings. And they make a declaration that is important for every Christian to understand. Watch verse 11. Who said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you have saw Him go into heaven. He will return. And when He returns, it is going to be in the exact same manner. More on that in a minute. So our Lord came, He lived, He died, He was buried, He was resurrected, and then He ascended back into heaven. Brother, this is what I want to talk about just for the next couple of minutes. And I want to bring out, highlight a couple of observations that I have made. Of course, this list is not exhaustive, but it is one I think that will do us well to dwell on here together. And my goal is that by the time each and every one of us leave here tonight, that you walk out that door and you have a renewed appreciation for who it is that you serve, what it is that you're doing here, and what it is that you hope to come in the future that you might spend eternity with heaven in heaven with God. Amen. Is everybody listening? No sleepers tonight, huh? Uh, I make this first observation. When we talk about the ascension, brethren, we're talking about the fact that Jesus came, but there was a point in which He had to leave. He left heaven to come here, and then there was a time where He had to leave here and go back into heaven. Okay? And when He did that, it marked the conclusion of something. Point number one, something ended. Something came to an end when our Lord ascended up into heaven. Something was brought to its conclusion. Something had been fulfilled. It had been fulfilled to the letter. And there was nothing more that our Lord could possibly do to achieve heaven's will. And so what did He do? He ascended back up from whence He came. Isn't that a good observation? And I start like this. I start maybe with the message of the Gospel. I think about our Lord. And brethren, it would do us good to, to dwell upon what our Lord did on our behalf. He left the confines of heaven. And I want that phrase to impress you. Because oftentimes we talk about how He came in the form of a man. He came in the form of a bondservant. He walked the, the roads and the hills of the Middle East. He underwent all the same problems and issues that you and I might have. A wave of emotions rocked Him. He suffered the pains of hunger. He suffered uh, pain itself. He suffered uh, all the things that you and I know so well. He left His abode in heaven to commit Himself for over three decades here upon this earth when He did not have to. And that is a stark testimony to the love that our God had for us, for you and for me. Because I'm going to tell you what, brethren, I don't know what it is that our Lord left. I don't know what it is that He forsook. I don't know... I cannot describe to you because I myself do not understand. I can only use the words that are found written upon the pages of the New Testament and accept by faith that God is describing to me accurately what is that I do not know. He forsook a perfect place that was not tarnished by sin, not tarnished by the evil actions of humanity. Uh, it was not plagued with death, disease, the consequences of evil actions. He forsook that to come and to walk upon the face of this earth. He left the glory and the splendor of the Heavenly Father. He left that behind and exchanged it for rain clouds and stormy weather. <coughs> he left eternal bliss. He shed immortality and put on mortality in this old, nasty, crumpled up body with all its bumps and scrapes and bruises. <coughs> and He walked in those shoes in the flesh for 30 years. Isn't that amazing? Are we not impressed by that? Does that not 
uh, at least evoke some thought on our behalf as to what links our Lord did for us before He even made it in the shadow of the cross. And He came and He underwent all sorts of things. They tried to kill Him from birth. That miraculous, that miraculous manifestation of God's power, He was born to a virgin as foretold by the Old Testament prophets. And He came to this earth and He was despised by His own. Right? We talked about that last night. And the men and the women that should have been longing and looking for the Messiah and should have looked at the prophets like Jeremiah and Isaiah and Zechariah and all those that foretold of the coming Messiah and seen very clearly and known and understood fully what it was that God had in His mind as to what the Messiah should have been, they should have been the ones of all the people on the face of the earth. They should have been the ones ready to accept Jesus as the coming Messiah. But they didn't. They didn't. Because through their own ego and their wicked, twisted imaginations and the sinful inclinations of man, they had built up for themselves not a Messiah not based on what God had revealed, but on what they wanted. And He goes and He walks in this environment. But He had to. He had to. Because of the love of God, there is the only way that mankind can be reconciled to Him. You have to reflect, brethren, upon the very nature of the God in which we serve. We serve a God that is holy and pure. We serve a God that is just. We serve a God that will not allow sinfulness to come before His presence. We serve a God who is all-knowing and all-powerful. And the only way, brethren, that His justice, His mercy, His integrity, His character could possibly be maintained and yet at the same time have a relationship with fallen man is by the sending of that perfect sacrifice. Remember what John the Baptist said in John chapter 1 and verse number 29, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. You see, the Hebrew writer nailed it. He was driving at this point himself in Hebrews 10 and verse number 4 when he said that the blood and bulls of goats ain't going to cut it. It can no longer be done that way. Under a temporary measure that was in vogue for about 1,500 years that God designed in order to keep His people holy and to introduce these concepts and to pave the way for the scheme of redemption that He was going to bring about through and by His Son. But those days are over. And for the sins of all of humanity, for once and forevermore, a perfect sinless sacrifice had to be offered. And that was exactly what Peter was getting at in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19 when he talked about that lamb without spot or blemish. And that took our Lord to the cross. Took Him to the cross. They didn't understand it. His disciples didn't. The people around Him could not fathom. And yet our Lord knew. And He went to the cross... And as he hung upon the cross, he hung on the cross for six hours. Okay? And I can imagine that every second felt like a day, and every hour felt like an eternity as he hung there. And during that six hour period, our Lord made seven statements. Y'all familiar with this? And the last statement that we have recorded that our Lord made, do you know what He said? You know what He said? It yeah. is finished. It is finished. It is finished. What's finished? His mission. The will of the Father. The scheme of redemption. That He would come and that He would bleed and that He would die because ultimately the goal was that He be that atoning sacrifice for the sins of humanity. And our Lord and Savior, He said, It is finished! And He gave up the ghost and shortly thereafter, what did He do? He ascended into heaven. There was nothing left for Him to do. There was no, nothing else that He needed to accomplish bodily here in the flesh. He had done and completed that which God had sent Him to do 
And so he went home. Isn't that a good lesson to draw from that? It was over his earthly soldier. It was done. And you know what, brethren? That's what our denominational friends can't get right. I don't want to be ugly or crude, but I also want to tell it like it is. They have concocted through them through a twisting of the Scriptures, through a misunderstanding, uh, I think really a lack of study of what should be pain, plain, painfully and plainly obvious, shouldn't it? The Bible is very clear concerning this. And what it has to say is simply this. That Jesus Christ came to set up a kingdom. But it was a spiritual kingdom. Many of our friends in the denominational arenas, they are looking and, and uh, uh, teach. Uh, they teach that Jesus came initially to set up an earthly kingdom, an earthly realm. And when that plan was foiled, then guess what he did? He sent up a, a set up a temporary measure. That measure is what we call the church. And then eventually, though he came as a, a meek as a lamb the first time, there's going to come a time that he is going to return. He's going to return this time as a lion, as a warrior, wage a holy war, and sit upon the David's throne in Jerusalem where he is going to reign for a thousand years with a resuscitated and rejuvenated uh, uh, Jewish empire. And then he is going to call the world to an end. And the Bible simply does not discuss any of that. It does not describe it. It does not speak to it. It is simply not there. And you know what? I think about passages like John chapter 6. You remember what happened in John chapter 6? Jesus fed 5,000 with the loaves and the fishes. You remember that? One of the miracles, one of the seven miracles that John took time to record through inspiration. Uh, here Jesus uh, performs a miracle, a miracle, a miracle of creation. And He feeds the masses with seemingly scant food. And the disciples took up 12 baskets of leftovers. Now look, I've cooked for a lot of folks. Okay? You ladies need to testify to this for me. Okay? You want to know how many people's going to be there so you know how much food, how much sweet tea to make, how many casseroles I need to put on, uh, what kind of dessert do I need to get, okay? And when it's all over, uh, what do we do at the end of potluck, right? All the ladies get back there, everybody pitches in, and we gather up all the leftovers, and what do you do? You carry them home in little bitty tubs. Have we ever had a potluck where all the brethren came and ate and we left with more food than it was when we started? We've never done that. Jesus did it. And you know what? Uh, the people noticed it. They noticed that it was a miracle. And so you know what they did? The Bible says that they sought to take Him to make Him their king. They were going to make Him the king right then and there. But when Jesus perceived their intent, the Bible says that He withdrew Himself. He withdrew Himself away from that situation. If there was ever a time for Jesus to set up an earthly kingdom to rule and to reign from some capital, to have subjects and armed guards, guess when a wonderful time would have been to start? John chapter 6. But guess what? He didn't do it. You know why? Because Jesus was not interested in an earthly physical kingdom. He was interested in a spiritual kingdom that is to be entered by way of and through the means of a spiritual birth of which He would reign from David's throne in the spiritual environs from heaven. And that's why he articulated it so clearly to a man like Pontius Pilate. Remember in John chapter 18 and verse number 36, he told him, he said, uh, my kingdom is not of this world. Amen. Let me tell you something. My kingdom does not originate from this world. It didn't start from this world. It does not operate by the values that this world holds so dear. And I am not going to have my followers take up arms and fight for my kingdom. That is not the purpose of what it is that I have come to establish. Isn't that wonderful? And He came, and He died, and He ascended up into heaven where He sat down at the right hand of God. His mission was complete. And that's the first thing I think of when I think about the ascension. Number one, something has come to an end. Watch number two. Something began. Something ended. Now something began when our Lord ascended up into heaven. Isn't that interesting? And you remember what Mark said. 
Mark said that he was received up into heaven and set down at the right hand of God. That denotes an, a, a position of authority. A position of authority. Remember what Peter said? Peter said, who has gone into heaven, who is at the right hand of God. Notice he mentioned that too, the right hand of God. But watch what he says. Angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to to him. You're already in Acts chapter 1. I want you to turn the page over to Acts chapter 2. This reign of Christ is going to be incorporated by the Apostle Peter in the very first gospel sermon in the book of Acts on the day of Pentecost. Isn't that interesting? Watch this. And he begins so with David. I want you to note or circle, outline, underline, do something in your Bibles from verse number 29 all the way down through verse number 33. And he brings up David, King David, King David of old. And how David not only was a king, David was a prophet. Because he spoke not concerning himself, but he spoke concerning of Jesus the Christ. Watch what he says here. <clears throat> Verse number 31. He foreseeing this spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ that his soul was not left in Hades nor did his flesh see corruption and that it didn't. Verse 32. Then Jesus God, watch it, was raised up of which we are all witnesses. Therefore be exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, He poured out this which you now see and hear. He reigns. He reigns. He is not defeated. He is in a position of authority. He has a role. He has a job. He has a function that He presides over the kingdom and one that He fulfills every second of every day. Right? Couple that with another passage that I told you to mark in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. See, if you're done with Brother Wiggins had told you, you can just flip right on over. Right, Brother Gary? Amen. And notice this. The Apostle Paul is ending his letter to the church in Corinth. And this is what he has to say. In verses 20 through 28, he is going to speak about this uh, meditorial reign that Christ is presiding over. And notice verse number 24. Concerning this reign, he says this, Then comes the end. The end of what? The end of time. The end of the world. Then comes the end when He delivers the kingdom to God the Father. When He puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. He reigns, but there's coming a time when He's going to deliver the kingdom up. What's the context for this? Well, keep reading. Look at verse 25. For He must reign. That's right. He must reign. What's He doing? Paul says he's reigning. He's got to reign and he'll continue to reign until the time appointed that he delivered the kingdom up to the Father. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. He reigns. Listen, let me tell you something, brother. Let's appreciate not only what Jesus has done and what Jesus has went through, let's take a moment and appreciate what He's doing now. What He's doing now. He is our advocate. He is our mediator. He is our Lord. He is our intercessor. He is our King. And He is our High Priest. Remember what the Hebrew writer says in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse number 14. He says that we have a High Priest that has passed through the heavens. That's a reference to the ascension of Jesus Christ. None of that, his meditorial reign, the position that he holds, the glory and the splendor that we can reflect on that he is now becoming of him, none of that would have been possible if he had never ascended back up from whence he came. Isn't that a good observation? Finally, let me, let me work on number three here. Don't worry, I've only got four. I ain't going to keep you here all night. I cannot help, brethren, I don't know about you, I cannot help but think about the ascension and not at least also dwell upon heaven. I think that's natural. It's natural, I think, in my mind. I think about Him going back to heaven. He left heaven, so it only makes sense that He would go back to heaven. And that's important, brethren, because guess what? That's exactly where I want to go. That's where I want to go. As a child of God, 
I want to go to heaven. I can't stress that enough. If you have a personal mantra, if you have a New Year's resolution, if you have something that you wake up every morning and you go over in your head or you want to read uh, to motivate you, to get you through the day, here's all you're going to need. I want to go to heaven. I want to go to heaven. And you know what? I want you to go to heaven. I want to go to heaven. I want to teach my children that the number one thing in life isn't where you go to college. Uh, it's not where you get married. It's not how many kids you got. It's not what kind of job you got. Material possessions are not what you need to be focused on. I could care less what my children do for a living as long as they're productive members of society, as long as they go to heaven. And somewhere along the way, I think we've stopped stressing that as a whole, haven't we? Heaven is the goal. Heaven is the goal. Nothing is more important. I don't care. And you know what, brethren? That's a mindset that we all need to have. And here's some wonderful things, some wonderful uh, observations about heaven. Remember, Jesus uh, taught His disciples to pray. Remember in Matthew chapter 6, He said, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Remember what He said in Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 12, Great is your reward in heaven. There we go. That's a good one. Uh, remember what Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 4 to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that never fades away reserved in heaven for you that's right that's right uh, remember what Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 18 you remember that one this is what he said he said who will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom Right? Philippians chapter 3 and verse number 20, our citizenship is in heaven. That's right. And probably, perhaps, my favorite uh, passage on the topic is found in John chapter 14. Mm. Y'all remember that? John chapter 14. Tell you what, brethren, if there's a passage you need to commit to memory, that's a good one. Mm -hmm. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe thou also in me. In my Father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would not have told you. And I go to prepare a place for you. Notice verse 3. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there you may be also. Hmm. Are those passages, do they mean anything to us? Right? Do we reflect upon those? And what am I to do as a child of God living here, whether I'm on Dayton Mountain or I'm down in Squatchy Valley, uh, if I'm in Dunlap, wherever I may be, from a funeral home parlor all the way down to McDonald's and everything in between. As I live the Christian life day by day, I get up, my feet hit the floor, and I go about daily business. And if you're anything like me, there's no telling where your day is going to take you. And all the people that are going to see you in between. Right, Miss Pam? That's right. And I'm going to be everywhere, and I'm going to do everything, and I might run into all sorts of people. I might even uh, randomly come across somebody in town that I hadn't seen in a long time. And while I'm doing so, I need to be making the decisions, brethren, every minute of every day that I am setting the proper example before the community and all that see, as God watches down from heaven, that I am justified in His sight and showing and demonstrating that that's where I want to go. I want to go to heaven. And I'm going to live my life in such a way that's going to put me there. In Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 1 and 2, the Apostle Paul said, Seek the things that are above. Don't, don't love the temporal. Don't love the physical. Yeah, it's shiny. Yeah, it's green. Yeah, it makes the bank account get better. Yeah, your credit might go up. But you know what? All these things are destined to pass away. Instead, what are we to do? We're to put our value, place our stock in that which we cannot see. Spiritual things in a spiritual realm. And that's where we lay up our treasure in heaven, in heaven above. And you know what, brethren? Uh, I asked John to lead that song for us. And my man led every verse. This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere 
beyond the blue. We believe that. And you know what's so sad? What's so sad is that there are those in the religious communities and it's even kind of been a fad that's kind of taken hold of our own brethren. And that is this. They have reinvented the idea of heaven. Heaven is no longer uh, in a, a spiritual destination. Rather, they maintain that this old world, instead of being destroyed, this old world is going to receive a makeover. Right? And you know what it is? They become infatuated with denominational scholars and people like the Jehovah's Witnesses. The Jehovah's Witnesses have been on this for a long time. Guess what? They maintain that only 144,000 are going to heaven. But guess what? You're out of luck because heaven got filled up in 1935. Now who's crunching the numbers? I don't know. Okay? How they got that figured? I don't know. But that's what they teach. So guess what? Terry is out of luck. Right? I'm out of luck. Instead, oh, instead, Brother Wiggins, guess what you've got waiting on you? When Jesus comes back and the end of time is, is, is brought forth, guess what you're going to have? You're going to receive a renovated, regenerated earth. And you're going to be able to receive a new body and you'll spend eternity uh, <clears throat> in Dayton, Tennessee with all the birds and the, and the trees and the sunshine hitting your face. Won't that be great? Won't be as great as heaven. And furthermore, let me say this. I don't know what book you're reading. Okay? Because Second Peter chapter 3, verses 10, 11, and 12 teach us that this world is going to melt with fervent heat. It's going to be destroyed and cast into oblivion. And finally, let me bring out uh, number 4, brethren. And I want you to turn back to 1 Peter chapter 1 for this. 1 Peter chapter 1. <clears throat> it reminds me of the second coming. The ascension does. But let me take it from this angle. Are you ready? It might seem kind of obtuse, but I'm sure I'm, I'm, I'll try to make sense of it before it's so will. You know, I think about those, those apostles all the time. A little bit of jealousy too, I might add. Because they got to do something that I'll never get to do. I'll never get to walk hand in hand with Jesus in Galilee. I'll never get to go with Him through the gates of the city into Jerusalem. They got to eat with Him. They got to sleep next to Him. They talked to Him. And I'm sure Peter, old Peter, the way he was, he probably cracked a few jokes along the way. Right? These men, as they lived and traveled with Jesus, and they got to witness Him unfolding Heaven's will here on this earth. Isn't that a wonderful thought? And you know what? That's so beautiful. They were eyewitnesses. I'm not an eyewitness. I'll never get to do that. I'll never walk with Jesus on the face of this earth. Notice what Peter says. 1 Peter chapter 1. Oh, I'm going to start and let's just read the whole section. Look at verse 6. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Notice verse 8. Whom having not seen, you love. Whom having not seen, you love. There is a blessedness, brethren, that is attached. Peter, Peter teaches this. There's a blessedness that's attached to loving and having faith in our Lord and not having seen Him. And you know what? This is really backed up by John chapter 20. You remember what Jesus did in one of His post-resurrection appearances? Remember, He comes in the room uh, with the disciples. Remember? And remember, but Thomas ain't there. Remember that? And he leaves, and a little while later, here comes old Thomas. And I bet he didn't get the, the 
air squeezed out of the cushion on the couch good before those guys were telling him, hey, let, let, let me tell you what happened when you were gone. Right? I can just imagine that. But what did Thomas do? Uh-uh. Uh-uh. I ain't going to believe. i got to have some evidence. i got to have the proof. Ain't that what people say today? Prove! And he says, I got, I'm going to I'm gonna have to take my hands and I'm going to have to feel those scars. I'm going to have to see them. I'm going to have to behold it. And a week later, guess what happens again? Jesus comes back and this time Thomas is there. Thomas is there. And what's interesting is that Jesus, the first item on the docket, guess who he went and talked to? And all that big bad talk that Thomas had brought forth, I'm going to have to do this. I'm not going to believe. I'm going to have to touch. I'm going to have to see. There is no indication in the Scripture that he had to do any of that. You know what he simply exclaimed? My Lord and my God. My Lord and my God. And this is what Jesus did. Jesus addresses him. And he says, Thomas, uh, you believe because you've seen. But watch this. But blessed are those that believe and yet have not seen. You know who that is? That's you. That's me. Isn't that interesting? God has not counted us out. God in His wisdom knew that the majority of the people that were going to believe in and follow His Son would live after the events of Jesus and the apostles. And so He left us His written Word. And I'm not going to be able to walk with Jesus, but the Bible teaches that I will get to be with Him. I'll get to see Him. Revelation chapter 1 and verse number 7. Behold, He cometh in the clouds, and every eye shall see Him. Even they that pierced Him will see Him. And you know what? Once again, I'm afraid our denominational friends have gotten it wrong. Okay? It's not an earthly kingdom that He's after. There's not a single passage that teaches that He's going to step foot back on the face of this earth. Not a single one of them. Instead, the Apostle Paul articulated it like this. You remember this? 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And the Lord Himself shall descend with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. And we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Watch it. And thus shall we always be with the Lord. No, I won't get to walk with Him here on in this life. But I have been promised that He will return. Remember Acts 1.11? In the same way that He ascended. We'll know it. It'll be audible. It'll be visible. Faith that has served us so well in this lifetime will no longer be a necessity. Faith will end in sight. The hope that has sustained us through endless days and hardships of this life will no longer be needed. Hope will end in reality. And we will be ushered in before the King in the presence of the Lord and of the glory of His power. And love will remain as the ages flow. And you know what? That relationship that we have together as the family of God will continue to endure forever and ever and ever. Something is ended. Something begins. Heaven should make a stop and pause and reflect. And finally, the ascension is a promise that just as the Lord left, He's not leaving for good. He will return. Our Lord's earthly sojourn was over and He ascended up into heaven. And one day, my earthly sojourn will come to an end as well. And I want to be where my Lord resides. Is that encouraging? Yes, sir. Alright. That's all I have for y'all. I hope this helps you. I hope it deepens your faith. I hope it causes you to, to reflect. Don't skip over Passages like Acts chapter 1 verses 9, 10, and 11 without considering what it is that our Lord has done and what He has promised to do in the future. The hope that that instills and what that ought to encourage us to do by faith 
to live faithful and righteous in every way that we possibly can with every breath that we take. Realizing that the world that we live in, the very environs from the air we breathe down to the very roads that we travel on, all scream in testimony to the fact that there is a God in heaven and that He will one day call us before Him and make us give an account of the things done in the body. And I want to be prepared for that day. I want to be excited for that day. I know it will be a sad day for many, but for the children of God, it will be the happiest day of our existence. And I think about that. And it all comes from our reflections on the ascension. If you're here tonight, you need to respond. We ask that you come forward, that you do so now. And as every Church of Christ preacher has ever said in the world, let's all stand and let's all sing.